Good afternoon. Welcome to this meeting of the Council of Aging for Knoxville and Knox County. I'm Mary Sophia Hawks, the Chair of the Executive Committee for the Council of Aging, and I'd like to call this meeting to order. If we could have everybody say the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which stand one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Is everything okay? Okay, can't hear you. Everything's fine. Okay. All right. So your executive committee um, report. Executive committee just before this meeting and discussed multiple issues and things that are going on. I uh, would like you to know that the clinic is very active right now, doing lots of virtual learning um, and virtual support and calls and check ins. And I will turn it over to you. Awesome. Um, Dottie, if you want to give the Office on Aging report. Yes, good afternoon. I hope everyone's doing well today. Um, we have... Okay, I'm having all kinds of audio issues today. I apologize. Um, this is Dottie Livers with the Office on Aging, and it's so good to have everybody join us today. Um, I want to share a couple of things coming up, just to make you aware. Um, on February 20th at 7 p.m., we will be having our virtual snowflake ball event where you can participate free from the comfort of your own home. If you'd like to know more information, please call us at 524-2786 or visit our website at knoxseniors.org. Um, additionally, we will be having our Pancake Fest, O'Connor's Pancake Fest event coming up on April 16th from 8 to 12. It will be a drive through event and senior expo. So save that date and we'll be sharing more information as we go forward. Um, if you'd like to know more about the Office on Aging and what we're doing, please give us a call. We'd love to chat with you. I'm going to turn it back over to you, Angela. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, um, we're going to go ahead and get started. Just a few housekeeping um, tips. I'm going to mute everyone um, as they enter, but after um, the presentation with Colin, we are going to open it up for Q&A. If you are on your computer and you can see the chat button, you can send um, your questions to the group or to me, um, Dottie Livers, I guess, the host, um, and I will make sure that those get read. Uh, so hold your questions till the end, and we'll have a huge question and answer session. Everything you want to know, we'll ever know, Colin's going to have your answer. Um, so I'll go ahead and get started here. Colin Kamesti is a 20-year veteran of the Royal Metro Fire Department in Knox County. From 2009 to 2000, sorry, uh, 2019, um, Colin was assigned to the Town of Farragut Fire Prevention Office, where he was responsible for the fire code compliance and new and existing construction. Colin has been a State of Tennessee and International Code Council Certified Fire Inspector since 2009. Since 2010, which, can you believe that? That's a lot of years ago. <laughs> Colin has been assigned to the Knox County <laughs> Fire Bureau as a fire and life safety educator. Colin routinely develops and delivers public education programs with the goal of reducing injuries and loss of life from fire and life safety emergencies. I sat through one of Colin's, maybe one or two of Colin's presentations, and they are fabulous. Colin also serves as a fire investigator with the Knox County Fire Investigation Task Force. Welcome to the program, Colin. Yes, uh, welcome everybody. Thank you, uh, Angela and everybody for having me today. Um, this is uh, my first experience with this. Um, so um, everyone, please be patient with me. 
Um, this is uh, um, something I think that we will be doing for a little bit still. So um, be gentle with me. <laughs> but today, what we're going to talk about is focusing on seniors and being fire safe at home. The presentation that we're going to talk about today, we're obviously going to hit on some bullet points where um, specifically seniors need to be conscious of their environment. These are all good, worthwhile tips um, to take home with you. Um, I would say that uh, my mother, having heard this presentation and me not having given it, uh, would probably call me on the phone and tell me to do a few things around the house. So um, take this information with you, share it with your neighbors, share it with your friends, and uh, hopefully uh, we finish out what we consider our fire season here in Knox County from October to March when the weather starts to warm up. Um, we can get through it with the least amount of homes destroyed, damaged, families displaced by fire. So I'm going to go ahead and jump into this because the group's time is valuable. And you didn't really come to look at me. So here we go. Um, so we're going to start off. This is my contact stuff. And I did send to Angela. Um, I don't know what that is. Oh, yeah, sorry. I'm having some technical stuff over here, too. Um, so I did send off to Angela this morning a PDF copy of this. So if anybody in the group would want to get a copy, um, Angela should have that and be able to share that with everyone. You may already be a part of the United Large Network. If you want the fact. All right. So the important part in this presentation is to understand that fire itself is time related. Um, we, as a fire department, regardless of where you live in the country, but specifically here in Knox County, we cannot do anything to help you until someone calls 911. And in those precious moments between when the fire starts and when either your smoke alarm activates to notify you that there is a potential emergency, or heaven forbid, a passerby or a neighbor walking their dog sees flame in your home's windows, those precious moments are the ones that myself and my partner as educators try to get people to take advantage of and respond swiftly to that emergency and get out of their home because it's those precious minutes that really make the difference between someone who gets out safely and someone who may be injured or, gosh forbid, lose their life in a fire. This video, which is recorded by the National Institute on Standards and Technology, I share this in a lot of presentations because it really kind of drives home the point that over the years as we've grown up, our home's construction has changed, our furniture's construction has changed, and the new materials that we find right now are very combustible, not like they were in the 70s and 80s. So a room like this, a standard room with standard furnishings uh, in a home um, is completely untenable by anyone, including protected firefighters, within 48 seconds of the fire starting. Fire doubles in size every minute it's allowed to burn without someone doing something to it, um, whether that be responding to an activated smoke alarm and getting out of the home or uh, using a fire extinguisher as if it's a kitchen fire. Um, those precious seconds are very important, and it causes us to try to have in place a plan to react to things that will happen quite quickly. So to understand what we can do and whether we're, um, you know, senior parents, senior caregivers, um, if we are younger adults with senior parents, um, if we are younger adults with younger adult children heading off to college, whatever the case may be, understanding some basic scientific principles of fire um, can help us eventually prevent them from ever happening. And I make the analogy 
of fire starting to baking brownie or cakes if you're not a brownie fan. Um, but each of these things have ingredients. And as we see here, the fire tetrahedron requires four yes, parts. I can't one at all. So that's how I waited. I sat on the chair because it's not Oxygen in the air that we breathe, um, and, and, and that's a concentration of 20.9% in the air that we breathe. Um, heat, which could be anything, heat from a stove, a burner, um, uh, a match, a cigarette, errantly on top of a couch. Um, and then you've got fuel, the thing that we consider that's burning. Um, in a fireplace, which we all picture in our head, um, that's the logs we put inside of it, or if it's a gas fireplace, the gas. And then there's a very important fourth part, which is rarely understood completely, but it's the chemical chain reaction. Once all three, heat, oxygen, and fuel come together and that spark ignites, there has to be a chemical chain reaction that supports continued combustion. And if we, understanding all four of those things coming together at once, have to happen in order for fire to start, we can take one of those bits away and fire can never happen. So if we step back and we look at brownies or cakes, for instance, right, we've got the mix, we've got eggs, we've got milk. If you want to, we may add a little bit of food coloring to it, whatever the case may be. But you have ingredients on the counter. And once you throw them all in a bowl and put the mixer to them, it's going to be a cake or a set of brownies. But if for some reason we don't have the eggs or don't have the milk or we have no mix at all, it cannot be a cake, it cannot be brownies. So understanding just these four basic parts and how they interact, we can develop from that a response strategy to fire emergencies, whether they be at home or at work or out camping, for instance. So now that we that, let's talk about the important part, which is what we're here for today, which is to understand that we can build a plan to react to these things, and that plan can also preemptively help us prevent fires from starting to begin with. And there are parts to this. Um, so the first part is having an exit strategy, right, which we call exit drills in the home, or EDIP. Exit drills in the home is merely the home's occupants coming together and looking at the way their home is laid out and identifying two ways out of every room that they're in. Whether that be the door on your bedroom and then out the front door of your home or the window in your bedroom, right? These are all pathways to that one central meeting place where the entire home comes together so that way when the fire department arrives, we can determine if everyone's out and if no one is uh, inside, then we can go to start putting the fire out. But if you tell us that someone is inside, then we can go right for that person as our number one goal in any fire response is life safety. So that's very important. But to have a practiced home fire safety plan is the critical part. And the emphasis is on practice. With having to have two ways out of every room, we would then suggest that you'd have the opportunity twice a year to practice your home fire escape plan. And we would encourage you to practice one of each of those exit routes at least once a year. Uh, it's very easy, right, to recall maybe back when we were in school and the fire alarm would go off and we'd line up at the door and we'd all walk outside to the playground and hang around for a little bit and then five minutes later we'd all go back into school. I mean, it's that, it's that simple. Um, but we don't want to get into the routine of just doing the same pathway all the time because fire, unpredictably, um, will choose wherever it wants to be. And if our primary mode of exit, which would be the front door of our bedroom out the front door of our home, for instance, is unavailable, we'll need to make sure that we understand that the rest of the ways out of our house are also available. So when we go to set up that plan, we need to look at some specific areas. And the first of which is our pathway. How are we getting from danger point A to safety point B? And as we walk through our home, mapping out our plan, look at your hallways and your staircases. Are there loose rugs? Um, do we have trip and fall hazards? Um, luckily, my, my child is 15 now, um, and I can find all of his fall and trip hazards to one room in the house. 
Um, so I don't stub my toe and I haven't stepped on a Lego in years. So the, all these are good things. Um, but we also wanna make sure that the doors that we have to pass through, whether it be our bedroom door or front door, back door, that they open smoothly and completely. Um, and that means the entire width of the open door frame. Now, we're talking about getting out of the house, but as a side note for just a moment, um, because we are talking about a senior community here, um, and it is a very important community, it's a growing community here in Knox County, and when they go to make sure um, that we're going to be able to be there when they need us, call 911, maybe they've fallen in the kitchen, um, maybe they're just having issues medically, and they're going to need some assistance, we need to make sure that those doors are opening all the way. So that way we can get things in like cots from ambulances and other sorts of equipment um, and be able to transverse the house um, completely and easily. Um, so making sure that doors open fully is important. And then for our second way out, we need to make sure that the windows in our bedrooms are accessible. Now, they should be at a height that should be reasonable for us to climb out of. And I will be the first to admit um, we have a YouTube channel. Uh, the Knox County Fire Bureau has a YouTube channel. We started it last March. Um, and on there, you can look up Edith, Exit Drills in the Home, and actually watch me climb out of my own bedroom window um, as I demonstrate having to have two ways out. It's not as easy as it sounds. It sounds somewhat straightforward. Um, but if you have to get out and there's bushes or uh, there's a significant drop off, um, sometimes as it was for me in that video, not so graceful. Um, so we need to make sure that the windows open fully, that we understand how to operate the screens that may be in our way, and that the pathways that we take to get from the exterior of the home to our meeting place are also free of slips and fall hazards. That's like I said, bushes, um, if you have um, rock flower beds, um, is that going to be an issue, especially when we talk about seasonal things? Right now we find ourselves on a sunny afternoon, but it was quite chilly this morning and quite eerie with that kind of frosty look all over everything. So these times of the year when we have to worry about frost and freezing issues, are we going to have an unintended slip and fall hazard with ice that may exist in the path that we need to take to get to safety outside the house? Now, that's not just necessarily in a fire emergency. Um, I know that there are mornings that I don't go down to my mailbox because the hill on my driveway would cause me to slide all the way out onto the street. Um, it's also not graceful, as I can attest to. So understanding that seasonally, we need to make sure that we are taking into account that there may be other environmental factors which could cause us to have difficulty safely exiting our homes. Now, one of the major parts and one of my topics that I tend to harp on is sleeping with your bedroom door closed. Now, if everyone will indulge me for a minute, um, we made sure earlier that this would work. Um, I could harp on this, but this video really kind of drives it home. So I'll let you guys listen in on that for just a moment. In the event of a fire, now, can people hear that? Let me know if people can't hear that. I keep them open because I was mom for so long. My kids were only two doors down from mine, always open. I'm not all that confident they would stop anything anyway. Carol, hey.
Colin. I don't think we can hear it because you're muted. To simulate where you live. And one of those structures is right here behind me. What I want you to do is I want to take you inside here and I want you to see how this looks like your home. And then once we get you outside, we're going to go ahead and recreate what would happen if a fire at this structure right here. Look pretty normal. Furnishing. You'll notice the difference down here. As you walk down, this bedroom door will be closed, and the one at the end of the hall will be open. And what I want you to do is pay attention to comparison of two of those and think about your family trying to survive this fire. All right, we just hit the button. We have ignition. Obviously, all the videos that I'm sharing today, um, and there will be two more, just because they are uh, spot on uh, with what we want to talk about today. Um, all those, again, they're on our YouTube channel. The link will be here at the end. Um, it's easy to search. Um, there are other videos on there, obviously, not to give ourselves our, our own little sales pitch, but um, if you can think about it, we probably try to make a video about it. So. Um, if there's ever anything, and obviously you can always email me or phone me, um, that is a resource. So um, now that we've kind of talked about um, close before you doze and understand that the movement of smoke um, is 
the most dangerous part of having a home fire because it's the smoke that winds up confusing people, disorienting people, getting people lost in their own home of 30, 40, 50 years. They will get lost. We will get lost. Um, firefighters, all the time, we have to make sure that we stay in close proximity, follow hose lines, and use very bright flashlights to try to pierce through the smoke. So understanding that sleeping with our doors closed at night will give us precious time to react to the activation of the smoke alarm, and that may allow us still to be able to use our primary route of exit, which is the bedroom door through our front door of our home. But if we have to, it also allows us time to get to our second exit point, that precious window in our bedroom, and get out safely. So now that we have a plan, we have it written down, we've practiced it once or twice, what other things can we do around the home to make sure that we're staying fire safe? The biggest part is having working smoke alarms. And it's not necessarily something that um, you wouldn't necessarily have a fire department not say, but having smoke alarms has been something that over the last few years, people just kind of don't pay attention to them anymore. And I see that, unfortunately, as something uh, positive. Um, a lot of people look at me kind of weird, but uh, smoke alarms are not something that should detract from our homes. Um, it's something that just adds to our safety. So having a smoke alarm and having it operating since the the study America Burning was done in the middle 70s, having one smoke alarm in your home increases your chance of surviving a fire by over 85%. Adding a second one, especially if you have a two-story home, increases your chances of surviving up to 95%. So this, as a one item, is very, very, very critical. Um, we have programs in place at Knox County Fire Bureau and our partners at, at Rural Metro Fire and Florence Fire Department and Seymour Volunteer Fire Department to make sure that the residents in Knox County are having access to working smoke alarms that are getting good, helpful advice so they can make the best decisions for their homes when it comes to installing new smoke alarms. So we are there as a resource as well. But when you talk about advocating for smoke alarms in your homes, there's just a few things that we need to make sure everyone understands, especially now that we find ourselves in the midst of reacting to this pandemic, where we don't necessarily have the ability to come to your home and spend time because we want to make sure as a fire service that we're not bringing anything dangerous to your home as we all try to practice best recommended uh, safety principles to keep ourselves safe. So we would encourage homeowners to make sure that they're testing their smoke alarms once a month. And that's simply by pushing the test button to make sure that it still alarms. And then replacing that battery backup inside of it at least once a year. And the best thing to do is to pick a day of the year um, and, and go by that. For instance, my mother likes to have all the batteries in the smoke alarms changed the week before Christmas because, never mind last year, because that's usually the time of the year every year where my brothers and sister descend on my parents' home in West Knoxville and we spend the holiday together. And my mother feels more reassured um, just by simply changing out those batteries the week before Christmas. Um, so if you also have the opportunity to look at having batteries that are, have the, sen the sealed 10-year lithium-ion battery, and those batteries don't need to be changed, but every 10 years when the entire device needs to be replaced. We want to make sure that the uh, installation of these devices is by the manufacturer's instructions, and the best recommended installation guideline is outside of every sleeping area and on every floor of your home if it's more than one story. We want to try to avoid things like attics and garages now, I'm sure if I could see a show of hands in the room, um, there are people out there with, just like me in my house in Carnes, there's smoke alarms in my garage, um, and that's fine. That's the way they're designed. Um, but we need to make sure that if we have them in our garages and our attics, that we are taking extra special attention to taking that vacuum wand to them and suctioning them out quite frequently 
to make sure that they are not getting filled with dust and bug bodies and other debris that in our homes, as we take care of the interior a little bit more carefully, aren't necessarily as dusty or dirty. When we go to install new devices, especially ones in the areas of kitchens, hallways outside of bathrooms, or anywhere where we may have an air register in the ceiling or on the wall where as part of our home's uh, heating and cooling system sucks in large quantities of air, we wanna to try to avoid these places with our smoke alarms, at least six feet from any of these places. Your manufacturer's instructions will give you specific guidelines, but having that distance helps you avoid errant activations of the alarm because of um, steam or smoke coming off the stove. Um, years ago, I've been in the fire service, as we heard, for a very long time. Um, but before that, um, I was a policeman, and it was not unusual for me, as I was learning to cook for myself, um, to know that certain things were done cooking because the smoke alarm went off closest to the kitchen. So we need to make sure that we're doing our best to avoid errant alarms so that way we know that when the device activates, we need to respond to it immediately and we don't overlook it thinking that, oh, that's just so-and-so using the shower too hot or um, that's just so-and-so burned some toast in the kitchen. We need to make sure that we're responding to these every time they activate. All right, so here's another little video. I want to make sure everyone gets a chance to hear. Right, installing and maintaining smoke detectors in your home is the easiest and the best way to prevent fire emergencies, and it only takes minutes. Are there risks associated with the detectors themselves, or what should I know about them? The biggest risk is not having a smoke alarm or having one that doesn't work. They make a huge difference in alerting people that there is a fire emergency. We recommend that you have one on every floor of your home, in the hallway near the bedroom, one in the kitchen, and one near the front. So, are there different types of alarms? As we talk about that 10-year replacement, um, the companies that are out there, when we talk about our, our major companies, Kida, First Alert, um, I'm sure some of you have uh, Kida and First Alert home, alarms in your homes. The manufacturers are starting to listen to the fire service when we would tell them that it's difficult for us to help our citizens, our customers, because they're buying new alarms to keep the best warning possible, but they keep having to replace the wiring in the ceiling. So most of your major manufacturers now are coming out with patch kits that will give you a cord that marries the existing wiring in your ceiling with the plug on the back of the new device. So the most you may have to do is replace that ring that actually holds the device to the ceiling. Now, if you have situations like this, and again, uh, we always want to stress that as the Knox County Fire Bureau, Rural Metro Fire, Carnes Fire Department, Seymour, your neighborhood fire departments, we're there to help you with guidance and suggestions. So if you have questions, obviously call me. I thoroughly encourage anyone with questions to call me. We'll spend some time on the phone and we'll get you uh, squared away with exactly what you need to do. The next thing is, and especially with the senior population, could that homeowner benefit from having a specialty device, whether that be a strobe alarm, um, whether that be a bed shaker, where when the smoke alarm activates, it activates a vibrating 
piece of equipment that's placed either underneath the mattress or underneath a pillow that alerts the person who may be sleeping that there is a fire emergency because their hearing may be um, not as good as it was, um, or they may be deaf. Um, having the strobe light on in the most occupied room in the home during the day is an alternate way of making sure that you get that precious alert. So we can also work with you individually, analyze and evaluate the best devices for your home. And we do have access to certain specialty devices um, that we can go ahead and install in your homes. So um, don't necessarily think that uh, we're gonna leave you high and dry, but there will be times where we'll have to um, encourage homeowners to uh, pick up certain things, um, especially patch kits and things like that. Um, but again, call us first, let's work through what you need and we'll try to get you the best help possible. Carbon monoxide devices. I put this one in here because right now, because of the winter months and everyone staying at home, um, a lot of folks are using a variety of different heating sources. We're seeing a lot of folks um, restart up old wood furnaces, um, restarting using uh, fireplaces they haven't used in years. If you're heating your home with a gas appliance or if you are heating your home with a wood burning appliance, you should have carbon monoxide detection in your home as well. Carbon monoxide is a naturally occurring byproduct of combustion, but when your heating device is not burning efficiently, there is an inordinate amount of carbon monoxide that's released into the home that may not be venting properly. And that can be dangerous over time as it, as carbon monoxide adheres to the hemoglobin in our system so much more readily than oxygen, it causes us to have long-term very ill health effects. So if we do have wood burning appliances, if we have gas burning appliances, we would always recommend that you have those routinely maintained by a qualified professional to ensure that they're operating correctly. Make sure that you're installing, if you have more than one floor in your home, a carbon monoxide device on every level of your home. All right, the next part to our plan is a fire extinguisher. Now, I teach this class quite often and to a variety of age groups. And one of the first things I tell anybody is, is that, look, after today's class, um, if you never want to use a fire extinguisher, I'm completely cool with that. We need to make sure that you understand that it has both benefits and detractions. Obviously, with the standard two and a half pound fire extinguisher that we have in our home, it's not a lot of discharge time. And because it's such a small device, it's only really meant for small fires. Buzzword is smaller the fire extinguisher, smaller the fire it's able to put out. So these two and a half pound fire extinguishers are designed for a stovetop fire, a small refuse can possibly in a bathroom or an office, but that's it. If your favorite chair is on fire in the family room, your two and a half pound extinguisher would love to be able to put it out, but it's just not capable of doing it. It's not designed to. So when you go to think about, well, should I use a fire extinguisher or shouldn't I? I always tell people to go with their gut, right? Whether it's buying lottery tickets, obviously the Powerball, if anybody wins from my advice, a little something in my Christmas stocking next year might be nice, but, um, go with your gut, the same gut that picks the routes you take home, the, uh, whether it's chicken or fish for dinner. Um, if your gut tells you when you see that fire that you need to get outside the house and not play with your fire extinguisher, then that's exactly what I want you to do. A lot of people come to us for these classes because they don't necessarily understand how the fire extinguisher works or how they would use it. And, and I would say that in the future, um, as part of a council activity, we do have a training aid that would make it easy for us to go to certain locations and engage the public and let them get some hands-on time with a fire extinguisher safely under the guidance of myself and my partner or other fire service personnel. So if there is an opportunity for us in the future to assist with a council event, um, we'd be more than welcome to bring that training aid out and uh, let some people get some hands-on time. But in the interim, 
let's take a second here and learn a little bit more about how we go about using our fire extinguisher. Alert. Before using a fire extinguisher, ensure that someone notifies the fire department, alerts others about the fire, and begins evacuating others from the premises. Fire extinguishers are for controlling small fires before they have a chance to spread. Before using one, make sure that you have a clear escape, you are familiar with the operating instructions of the fire extinguisher, and that the fire extinguisher you have is suitable for the fire you're facing. Before using the extinguisher on a fire, Look at the fire class symbols on the front label to make sure the extinguisher you have is suitable for the type of fire you're facing. The most common classes of fires are A, B, C, and K. Class A fires involve common combustibles like wood, paper, and tires. Class B fires involve flammable liquids like gasoline and petroleum oil. Class C ratings involve energized equipment or things that are plugged in like appliances, computers, televisions, and electric machinery. Class K fires involve cooking oils and greases, like vegetable fats. Once you determine that the extinguisher is the correct type for the hazard, proceed to operate the extinguisher using the pass technique to control and extinguish the fire. First, hold the extinguisher upright and pull the pin. Next, stand 8 to 10 feet from the fire and aim the nozzle at the base of the fire. Do not get too close or aim the nozzle too high. Once the nozzle is aimed at the base of the fire, squeeze the levers together to begin discharge of the fire extinguishing agent. Maintain your distance from the fire and sweep the nozzle from side to side, sweeping three to six inches beyond the right and left edges of the fire. Discharge the extinguisher until contents are exhausted to prevent reignition. Move around the fire to confirm it is completely extinguished. Your quick action can save lives and protect property. Using the fire extinguisher properly is only one part of a fire safety plan. For more information and training videos, Go to www.femalifesafety.org. All right. So now that we have our exit drills in the home, we understand the importance of smoke alarms. We know that we should have a carbon monoxide detector for burning gas appliances or wood burning appliances. And now we have an understanding of how to use a smoke alarm. What is our what is our plan, right? We we should have a plan if we're going to use our smoke alarm or if we're going to use our fire extinguisher, excuse me, we should have a plan. So what we normally teach people is the acronym RACE, RACE to safety, rescue, alarm, contain, and extinguish. So under R, we're just going to sound, we're just going to try to get everybody out of the house, right? Start screaming fire, fire, fire. I share this story with folks. Um, years ago, um, my, uh, my ex-wife had, uh, had a coupon, right? Um, gosh forbid, I, I apparently got this story in the divorce. Um, she always hated it, but, but bless her heart, for classes like this, it's the best story that you can tell. Um, she was uh, making some cinnamon rolls. Um, the uh, butter had not completely defrosted when she threw it in the firing pan, and we had a fire, a stovetop fire. Um, it shows that regardless of how long I've been doing this job, um, anyone is susceptible to a fire emergency, so we should be prepared. So the fire started. My son and I are, are reading books. He's uh, in first grade. Um, we're reading books on the couch. Um, she starts yelling, fire, fire, fire. It causes our attention. We start moving toward the front door. Um, she grabs a pot lid for the frying pan that she's using puts it on top of the uh, pan and successfully extinguishes the fire and nothing is damaged, right? Perfect scenario. She reacted in a timely manner, sounded that alarm, got us moving, um, all this occurring before the smoke alarms ever went off in our home. So this is an important lesson to learn. So rescue yourselves and whoever you're with from danger point A to safety point B. Meanwhile, sounding the alarm, right? At home, uh, we're calling 911. We're getting help coming as swiftly as possible. In a commercial occupancy like a church or a movie theater or a school, you may find a pull station, pull that pull station, get help coming. Never hesitate to call 911. Calling 911, even multiple times, not discouraging it, call. The more information we have, the better we are as your fire department when we get there. And then contain. 
as we pass through doors, going through either our home or wherever we find ourselves, church, grocery store, close the doors you pass through. Just like close before you doze, by simply putting a door in the path to a fire's progress, it slows it down and allows us as the fire department to be able to better extinguish a room and contents fire as opposed to an entire structure fire. And if all those things are in place, rescue, alarm, and contain, we eventually get to E for extinguish. And when you get to E for extinguish, if the fire has doubled in size at that point, and again, your gut tells you, look, I don't need to be playing with this fire extinguisher, I need to just go outside in my safe meeting place, then that's what I want you to do, okay? Be safe. We, as the fire department across the county, um, we are there, we are ready, we will be there. Um, we sit on the edge of our seats waiting for you to call us. Um, that's a bit of an exaggeration, but we go to school for many months. Uh, we train hundreds of hours a year to make sure that we're ready for your emergency. Um, please use us. We always want you to be safe. So now we're going to talk about a couple of round the house type items that I think everybody needs to be mindful of, especially now that we're in our homes um, with virtual learning and other things going on. Grandparents may be hosting kids during the day to allow their, uh, their children and other family members to go to, go to work. Um, so we want to make sure that as far as electrical goes, we're not overloading our outlets. Understand that the two plugs that are there, if we put adapters on them that are not uh, ground fault circuit interrupted protected, um, you're doubling, sometimes tripling the amount of power that goes through that outlet. And the more power that goes through it that it's designed for, that can lead to resistance, resistance leads to heat, and eventually some period of time down the road, um, we could leave us susceptible to a fire emergency. So don't overload your outlets. Um, do not, please, plug multiple extension cords in together to get across the house. Um, always try to use, as best as possible, a code-compliant installed electrical outlet. Examine your cords before you use them. If they are obviously damaged or worn, replace them before you use them. It is the best thing you can do to make sure that you're not going to have an issue. And then obviously um, use a ground fault protected power strip. If where you need additional outlets, you don't have them. Plug the power strip into the outlet, leave the other outlet in the duplex um, outlet design empty and just use the plugs that are on the power strip. Home heating, right? Because we're in the middle of winter time. Um, these afternoons when the sun comes up, it kind of fools us a little bit and we had uh, opportunities of the last few days to remember what fall might feel like, but it's still winter time. So if we're going to be using supplemental heat in our homes, make sure that we're keeping those heaters at least three feet away from anything that's combustible. And that's especially things like furniture or draperies or bedding, for instance. Um, over time, being too close, the heater will have an opportunity to possibly create a fire emergency. If you're looking to add supplemental heat to your home, there's lots of portable heaters out there, and we need to make sure that we're identifying those that are best for us especially if we're, you know, senior adults or if, again, we're hosting younger children at our homes during the day because their parents need to go to work or wherever else, look at those space heaters that have special features where they tip over, they shut off, or um, they have a digital thermostat on them that's easier for us to understand when it gets to a certain temperature, it shuts off. Lots of features out there research the ones that are going to work best for you. And when you do use them, never plug a space heater into an extension cord. The amount of current that's used for that heater, the extension cords traditionally just cannot handle that amount of current. And it puts us at risk for a fire emergency, not even knowing that one could happen. And if we're going to be using fireplaces or wood stoves, things that we haven't used in a very long time. As I said earlier, please make sure that they're being routinely inspected by a qualified professional to ensure that they're burning efficiently and that CO is not going to be a hazard in the home. 
All right, kitchen. Every year, kitchen fires represent about half of our nation's fire service response for residential home fire emergencies. And it also represents a little less than half of the fire injuries that occur every year in this country. So cooking, though it seems to be the one thing that we can do, um, that we do every day, it is still the most dangerous thing that we do in our homes because we bring fire inside of our homes to cook the food that we eat. So to say never leave cooking unattended seems kind of self-explanatory, but there will always be a few every year where someone either starts cooking on the stove and walks away from the home to get the kids at the neighbor's house, or um, because they've worked super late that night, they've come home, started to reheat something on the stove, and then fallen asleep, and then woke up to their kitchen smoke alarm going off because there's a fire on the stove. So please, please, please never leave cooking unattended. And when we design our kitchens, look at how we use them. Now it says to avoid using loose or baggy clothing, um, but remember, if we're reaching over the stove, over the cook surface to reach spices or other cooking things that we use on a regular basis, we are putting ourselves at risk of possibly catching our clothes on fire and receiving a burn. So if there are things that we routinely use to cook with, make sure that they're placed in a position where we're not having to reach over the cook surface in order to get them. Another popular thing, especially with my child coming up, is the microwave. It's a wonderful tool, um, but we need to make sure that we understand that it operates by superheating the liquid that's inside of whatever it is that we're cooking. So if we are warming up something like soup, or uh, if we're warming up something that has a watery base to it, we have the opportunity of receiving a very dangerous burn or a scald injury if we are putting it in the microwave and then taking it out at a height where we're asking ourselves to overreach our arms. So um, look at the way your kitchens are set up. If it's better for someone to have a countertop model as opposed to one over the top of your cook surface, remember um, having the best opportunity ergonomically to reach in and grab your food items and avoid getting it caught on the lip of the microwave on the way out and then spilling on us can save us a very, very dangerous and very, very painful or injury. All right, a couple of uh, resources here for you. Obviously, this is our YouTube channel. Um, if you do uh, go on YouTube quite frequently, I will tell you that um, right now we have over 700 subscribers. We're very fortunate um, that we tend to put out some good stuff. Um, but that 0.7% that subscribe to our channel, um, the other 99.3% don't. Um, and about 8,800 views a week. Um, so there's a lot of good stuff on there. Um, so I encourage everybody to go and share those things. Every bit of it's shareable. Um, if you want to send it to friends and family, I thoroughly encourage that. The Home, uh, Home Safety Council is another resource. Um, if you're curious about other residential fire safety initiatives like fire sprinklers, or the improvements that are occurring almost on a daily basis to smoke alarm technology, the Residential Fire Safety Institute is a wonderful place to go. And if you're having issues with developing your own home fire escape plan, ready.gov is a wonderful resource where you will find already pre-designed plans. Um, my favorite plan to tell people to go look for is the zombie apocalypse plan. Um, believe it or not, and I know there's some folks out there that are giggling, um, and that's fine. Um, believe it or not, it's out there, and it's basically just your standard plan that causes you to put a few things aside for a few days of losing power at your home or getting trapped by the snow. And so having a variety of different planning ideas available for you to peruse at ready.gov is a great way to get your Edith plan started. Um, and then obviously you can always reach me, um, whether it be by email or by phone, um, and we will always take the time. Um, it may be more of a exchanging of emails or very long phone calls until we can get out of some of these COVID precautions um, before we can come and sit down in your home and visit. Um, but we will always be available. 
to help you plan out your home fire escape plan. Now, all like I said, all these ideas are good for adults of all ages. Um, so um, make these adjustments. Um, if you see things, share things. Um, the best thing I can do is have you practice that home fire escape plan. Um, I'm around a lot of folks that have their first fire emergency almost on a weekly basis now. Um, it's been a very dangerous fire season here in Knox County. And any one person's home that's lost to fire is a tragedy. Um, and I would much rather everyone understand the importance of having a home fire escape plan and practicing that routinely to understand that that's the best way for you to survive a fire emergency. So at this point, I'm going to turn off my video so y'all can actually see me again, I think. Right? Am I back in my kitchen, my sparse kitchen? Um, uh, there's a little video lag, but yeah. Um, there you, I am. Are you ready for Q&A? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. If, if anybody's got questions, please, um, I, I, do you want to monitor that, Dottie, or am I doing that, or how do you want to do that? Yeah. Um, I just invited people to unmute themselves. Um, okay. You can unmute yourself by star six. If you have a question, you can go ahead, and we'll try to get it, you know, slowly. Colin? Hi, mm -hmm. this is Deb. My name is Deb Butler. And I, when my house was made, I had one of those fire uh, detectors that were built into the house. Mm -hmm. um, I believe you talked about a, a, a fix it kit or repair kit for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What, right. How would okay, I so, go about all right, so the smoke alarm that you have in your home, the first of which, first question I normally ask homeowners, this is a great conversation, this is wonderful, so thank you, Bev, for bringing this up. Um, when, when, you, when one of your alarms goes off, do they all go off, or do they all go off separately? Well, actually, it doesn't work anymore. <laughs> That's why I was oh, asking you. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> oh, gracious sakes. All right. Well, yeah, so we're beyond all that. All right, so fair enough. All right, here we go. All right, so um, what you need to do, the first thing you need to do is um, if it's a battery-operated standalone device, in other words, it's not wired into your home's electrical system, it's simply it going is. to your home store. It, it is it is a standalone it's device, the, the original, The original ones were wired into my home, oh. and I was really okay. upset when they stopped working. So I had to yeah. get the yeah. standalone ones with the batteries put in. Mm -hmm. Right now, depending on their age, now when you say original for your home, is your home 20 plus years old? Yeah. Yeah, well, I would, I, I would, yeah, I would tell you that at that age level, um, you're probably, if you want to go back to having centrally wired devices where one goes off, they all go off, um, you would probably have to have someone who's comfortable with, it doesn't have to be an electrician, folks, it really doesn't. Um, we as the fire department can't do it because that's not liability that our departments are willing to accept. But um, a homeowner can easily do this, um, but we always encourage you to make the best choice for yourselves. And if that's meaning getting an electrician, then by all means. But you bet you would probably have to um, go back to having those that, that wire coming out of the ceiling rewired with a new connection to marry with some brand new alarms. Now, I say that, but there's also technology out there now, folks. Um, they call them Wi-Fi, but they really are not. Um, it's a small radio frequency that's shared between the devices. And as long as they're close enough to each other, they communicate by that RF frequency and even though they're not wired together, they will behave like they are. Um, so these are uh, a growing option for folks who want to have, when one goes off, they all go off, but they don't want to have their home wired or they don't want to involve an electrician. So these mm -hmm. are an option, Bev, for you. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they're commonly available at your home store of choice. Um, mm -hmm. you, you would just need to research that. Okay. 
Oh, that sounds good. I think I will. Thank you, Colin. <laughs> yeah, not a problem. And and I would tell you this, Bev, if um, if you do do that, um, hopefully, uh, if not, then you can get my contact information uh, from Angela or Dottie. Um, give me a call before you do it, before you go and install them on your own, um, <laughs> because we are here to help, and we can help install those. Um, we can't help rewire your home, but we can help. <laughs> Um, okay. Uh, we just need to make sure that we're abiding by whatever the best case recommendations from the health department are to keep people safe as we um, continue through uh, the asterisk of 2020 with the COVID. So. Okay. Okay. All right. Wonderful. All right. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Hey, Sophia, do you have a question? I do. Uh, Colin, earlier you mentioned having um alarms outside of bedrooms but on the map mm -hmm. that was shown it actually showed them inside the bedrooms um right. okay the reason i'm curious about that mm -hmm. is because i have a smaller bedroom in my home that has a ceiling fan and mm -hmm. i don't know exactly where to place that alarm if i have to put it in the bedroom that right. on top of the fact that my house is only 1,100 square feet, and so mm -hmm. the fire alarm in the central hallway is only six feet from that bedroom. Right. Okay. So, uh, so um, in the particular case that you have here, <clears throat> it sounds like they're not wired devices, or the wired device is the one that's outside in the hallway. Um, one of the things that we talk to homeowners about is that if we add standalone battery operated devices, those will only work when they come in contact with smoke. So as the smoke, let's just imagine, for instance, that in a one story home, the kitchen's traditionally on one side of the house and the bedrooms are on the other. And if the kitchen fire were to start in the middle of the night and then slowly as the smoke reaches each individual smoke alarm, it's going to start to activate. Absolutely. Now, is that one that's furthest from your bedroom that activates first? Is it going to be loud enough for you to hear it? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but as the smoke progresses through the home and gets to the one in your hallway, for instance, and activates, that may be ideal for the best activation for your notice so that you can react to it. Um, and that's wonderful. Um, we want to make sure that you're having that timely activation notice. If you want to put a battery operated one inside your bedroom, just understand that it's going to need the smoke to start getting in your bedroom in order for it to activate. And if Got that's it. the case, you're only going to be able to use the window to get out of your home at that point because the smoke has already reached a quantity in the hallway outside your room, especially with the door closed at night, that probably makes walking out down your hallway and out your front door probably impossible right so okay thank you now but you know i mean in a wire device i have a ceiling fan in my bedroom um and uh, i do have a wire device in there you just need to have it in such a place where it's not affected by the wind that's generated by the fan moving um again it's a case-by-case -case basis um and if we have an opportunity to in the future and if you would like with uh, lessened COVID restrictions, uh, us to come over to the house and give you a consultation. Well, we do that all the time. Thoroughly encourage it. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Uh, star six, if you need to mute your, unmute yourself, I believe. All right. Well, well I'm going to. Well, just one last thing before we go, in case this uh, jars anybody's um, uh, questions. Um, if you do need um, the smoke alarm assistance um, and you do have access to a computer, um, you can always visit the Knox County Fire Bureau's website on the Knox County's website. It's knoxcounty.org slash fire. And on that front page, there will be a button for you to push that says request a smoke alarm. 
and you'll fill out that sheet and that'll come to my partner and I and then we will give you a call. It is probably the best way um, to reach us. Um, if you do social media um, and, uh, and find yourselves on Facebook, there's also a button on our Facebook page that allows you to make that same connection. Um, but you can always call me, always email me. Um, there's always gonna be questions, folks. Um, I've been doing this for 20 years. I have bored people for the last 15 years at Family Functions over this stuff. Um, I would love to have new people to talk to about this. So call me frequently. I'm just joking. But seriously, um, <laughs> it's sometimes very hard to understand how all this works. Um, so we are here as a resource. Um, call us. Uh, we are here to help. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Colin. I know I learned a lot. Absolutely. I, I know I've learned a lot the hard way already, but um, definitely learned a lot from you too. So we appreciate it. And thank you all for joining us today for the Council on Aging meeting. We're gonna meet in, um, next month, 2.30 at 11 o'clock and talk about preventing cardiovascular, or not 11 o'clock, February 11th at 2.30 p.m. Um, and we're going to be talking about preventing cardiovascular disease. So we hope you'll all join us again. And thank you so much, Colin. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Uh, I'm going to go.